This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave Himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for Himself a people for His own possession, zealous for good works. Titus 2, 11-14. In 2010, Chris Simpson led a white pride march in Michigan. In 2012, he left the white supremacy movement that he had been involved in for most of his adult life. Chris saw the movie Courageous, and he was convicted that the emptiness in his life could not be filled by hate, but only by Christ. Five days after being baptized, Chris was in a skin and vein clinic to start the painful process of removing his Nazi and white pride tattoos. He has 42 of them, and it may take years for him to complete that process. The hate which scars his arms, his chest, and his neck may not be easily removed. The scars on his psyche that led him down that path in the first place may also take years to heal. But how long does it take to rem remove the guilt of sin? That is a question for the grace of God. And it depends on what God can do with any sin that we commit. You know, the grace of God is a subject that none of us are exempt from. We all need it. Paul says, what then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. That's Romans chapter 3, verse 9 through 12. You'll notice that Paul doesn't let up. All, none, not even one, none, none, all, none, not even one. What's Paul saying? We're all guilty. None of us is sinless. We need God's grace. You know, Titus 2, 11 through 14 is a great passage about grace, portraying it as the precious gem that it is. As we examine Paul's words more closely there together, we see some beautiful facets of this great Bible doctrine. In the first place, in this text, we see that grace has appeared, verse 11. You know, Paul mentions this grace four times in his short letter to Titus. In the first place, he mentions it in Titus 1 and verse 4, and he wanted Titus to have and experience that grace. And then in chapter 3 and verse 7, he tells him that grace and mercy saves us and it makes us heirs of eternal life. And then in chapter 3 and verse 15, he expresses his desire that grace be extended to all the Cretan Christians. And so in a letter that begins and ends with grace, Paul celebrates the appearance of grace. We're not waiting for it or hoping it will appear. It has come. John says in John 1, 17, the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. When Jesus appeared on this earth, grace became tangible and visible. Paul makes this statement as motivation for the groups of people that he addresses within the church to be obedient. Obedient to the commands to conduct themselves as he says. Why should older men and older women and younger women and younger men and bond servants act as Paul tells them because God's grace has appeared. Now we're going to come back to that in a moment. 
But the point is that there's no motivation for us to be obedient to God if grace has not appeared. But because grace has appeared, I want to serve and to follow God. What a gesture of love for God to see my need before I was even born and to meet that need by giving His Son to die in my place. It's funny, two businessmen were traveling to Atlanta, Georgia, and one of them had never been to the South before. They stopped at a restaurant for breakfast. And when their meal came, the man who had never been to the South saw this white, mushy stuff on his plate. He asked the waitress what it was, and she said, Grits. And well, he replied, Ma'am, I didn't order that, and I'm not paying for it. And she replied, Sir, down here, you don't order it, and you don't pay for it. You just get it. Well, that's how Paul describes grace in this passage. We didn't order it, and we certainly couldn't pay for it, but thanks be to God, we got it. Grace has appeared. That's what Paul says in Titus 2 and verse 11. But as we look at that great text, we second see that grace is available. That's also in verse 11. I saw a slogan on the side of a plumber's van and it read, There is no place too deep, too dark, or too dirty for us to handle. To me, that's a wonderful explanation of the gospel. No place too deep, too dark, or too dirty. God's grace has brought salvation to all men. He has brought it to the immoral, like those described in uh, Romans 1, 18-32 by Paul. Everything you can imagine was done by those people in Romans chapter 1. He has brought it to those like the moral, like those described by Paul in Romans chapter 2, verse 1 through 6. And he has brought it to the religious, like those described by Paul in Romans chapter 2, verse 17 through chapter 3 and verse 18. Do you see what that indicates? It doesn't matter who you are, immoral, moral, or religious. You need God's grace. And certainly while it's better to be moral and religious than immoral, when compared to a holy God, all of us are miserable sinners in need of grace. The Empire State Building is much taller than the FedEx Building that's right next to it. But which is closer to the moon? Well, I guess technically the Empire State Building is 1,250 feet closer, but how much does that matter from 240,000 miles away? Isaiah said, Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor his ear so dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Friends, God's grace is available to you if you have a horribly sinful past. You may have convinced yourself that you have been too bad for too long for God to save you. Well, I think about Paul. Paul says it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom Paul says, I am foremost of all. Yet for this reason I found mercy so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate His perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in Him for eternal life. 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16. How many times does Paul point to his past and then point to God's grace in helping him to overcome it? 1 Corinthians 15, 9 and 10. He says, I'm the least of the apostles who am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 9 and 10. Ephesians 3, 7 and 8. He points to the great sinfulness of his life and his past and how God could work with him despite that. You know, God's grace can immediately forgive your past and ultimately help you overcome it. God's grace can help you if you've got a woefully sinful past. God's grace is also available to you if you are struggling with sins in your life right now. Maybe it's a sinful habit or an addiction. Or maybe you know that you're in a sinful relationship. Maybe it's a sinful attitude. Or you constantly fight the battle of the tongue. 
Paul said he was suffering with a thorn in the flesh, and Scripture doesn't tell us what it was. But whether it was a physical infirmity or a spiritual struggle, the answer would have been the same. My grace is sufficient for you. There it is. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, God's grace. That does not mean that He will take the struggle away. But He will provide an escape route every time, whatever it is that you're dealing with. Paul says that uh, no temptation has taken you, but that which is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able, but will with the temptation provide a means of escape that you may be able to bear it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Furthermore, God's grace is available to you if you are a good Christian trying to live the Christian life. We continue to sin as Christians, a point that John makes clear in 1 John 1, 8 through 10. Most of us would confess the sins of thoughts, words, and actions nearly every day. But we also need grace in other areas. We need grace even for hidden faults. Psalm 19 and verse 12. What are, what are those? Well, they may be sins that we commit that others don't know of. Maybe it's hatred or, or lust that we harbor in our hearts. They may be sins that we commit that we don't know of. What if we offend somebody and hurt them and they don't tell us about it so we don't know? They may be sins that we commit that are not known to us or others but that are known to God. What about a failure to do what God commands or the neglect of an opportunity? That's the beauty of walking in the light of Christ. His blood continually cleanses us. 1 John 1 and verse 7. Friend, God's grace will be available to you as long as you live on this earth. You don't face a future battle that is outside the scope of God's grace to help you overcome it. Grace is not a license to sin. Romans 6, 1 and 2 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we who died to sin live any longer therein? But neither does it teach that God's grace is exhaustible or limited to those who are striving to walk in the light. It's available to everyone. He has not dealt with us according to our sins nor rewarded us according to our iniquity, Psalm 103 and verse 12. But as we look at this great text on grace, we see that grace is also admonishing, verse 12. God's grace is not simply inert or passive. Paul calls grace a teacher. And this takes us right back into the context. Paul was sharing some of the teaching of grace in this letter leading up to this statement. You see, as you look at grace in this text, it makes ethical demands of us to live a certain way and to deny certain things. Grace trains us to say no to certain things. Because we have said yes to Jesus and to His forgiveness, we must say no to ungodliness and worldly passion. Jesus says no man can serve two masters. He'll either hate the one and love the other. He'll cling to one and despise the other. But you can't serve two masters. Matthew 6, 24. We can't live the lifestyle of the unsaved or serve unholy cravings. God is patient with us and He extends grace to us as long as we are making the honest attempt. But when we obey the gospel, we are making a pledge of self-denial and service to Christ. Grace trains us to say no to certain things. But grace also trains us to say yes to certain things. It's, it trains us. It admonishes us. When we remove the baggage that weighs us down, Hebrews 12 and verse 1, we are in a better position to assume the positive lifestyle of a redeemed person. We come to live a life of self-control, of righteousness, and of godliness. This means that we're being transformed inwardly. That's self-control. And we're being changed outwardly. That's the righteousness and the godliness. We become a different, better person inside. And people can see the difference in our lives. God needs us to say no and to say yes. Why, Paul? Because of this present age. He has us right here, right now. 
to live the Christian life, to draw the unsaved to Him. We're not hiding our light under a bushel. Grace teaches us to let our light shine. You know, one extreme is to deny that grace is sufficient for us. But the other extreme is to say that God's grace does everything and we don't have to do anything. Neither extreme is correct. You see, grace teaches us to live a new and improved life. It admonishes us. It urges us. But then I see another important truth. As I look at grace again, I see that grace is anticipating. Verse 13. Grace was accomplished in the past. When Christ was crucified, was buried, and then rose again. But grace points to the future as much as it points to the past. It changes our future and it makes the future worth striving for. Without grace, we're right to look at the future with fear and to dread and horror. Without grace, death is the ultimate defeat. It means an eternity separated from God. An eternity full of endless suffering. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 7, And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Christ says that these will be raised from the grave to inherit the resurrection of condemnation. But look at what having God's grace in our life does to our outlook. Yes, we enjoy the benefits of His grace every day that we live on this earth. But along with that, we live with hope. We look forward with confident expectation. We are going to see Jesus personally when God determines that it's time. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul says, For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Revelation 1-7 says, Behold, He is coming with clouds, and every eye will see Him, even those who pierced Him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over Him. So it is to be. That's the worst nightmare for every unprepared, unsaved person. But for us, it will be a blessed moment, a happy, a favorable, fortunate, and privileged time. Everything we've anticipated, why we have sacrificed, will be vindicated by Christ's appearing. Grace is what makes that possible. It is what will cause us to be able to stand on that day. As Jude writes, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. Verse 24, as we look at the grace and its various facets, we we see that it's anticipating. It looks ahead to the wonderful future made possible by grace. But I want you to notice another facet of grace in this text. In verse 14, we see that grace is activating. Just like grace is not a license to sin or activity, Grace also gives us a mission. Paul reminds us that God's grace is costly. He gave Himself. Highest price that could ever be paid. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son the greatest price. But then we see that God's grace is personal. He gave Himself for us. He loved me and gave Himself for me. Galatians 2 and verse 20. And God's grace is thorough. He gave Himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed. There's the purpose of grace. And God's grace is relational. He did all this to purify for Himself a people for His own possession. 
But what is its ultimate purpose? God wants His grace to make us respond in a certain way. Here's a test of your spiritual health, a a heavenly checkup. In view of what Jesus did for you, how do you feel? Do you take His grace for granted or feel entitled? Do you even think about it? And does it influence how you live and what you do every day? Paul tells us what our response should be, to be zealous for good deeds. If every one of us got a hold of this, here is what is likely to happen. This is what we could anticipate. Church buildings worshiping God in spirit and truth would be full on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, all during the week perhaps. There'd be more Bible studies going on in our society than we could get to. And the baptistry would be constantly occupied and the water stirred. Every community would be full of people who knew Christians by fruitful faith. Sign-up sheets and solicitations for volunteers to teach Bible classes, to provide transportation needs for the needy, to visit the sick and the shut-in, to embrace and to welcome our visitors would not just visibly change, they would disappear. They wouldn't be needed. We'd be so on fire that people from all around the world would come to watch us burn. In other words, we'd look a lot like the early church whose good deeds came because they truly understood the power of God and the power of grace in their lives. Think about this. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. The Bible says that the God had begotten those folks again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That living hope caused them to do all that they could to spread the gospel message wherever they went. They endured privation. They endured persecution. They endured personal loss so that the gospel could go forward. In 1 Peter chapter 1, you you have a passage about persecution. People who were living for Christ who suffered loss, but they kept sharing the good news even in those adverse situations because they experienced the power of grace in their lives. Acts 4.33 says that abundant grace was upon them all. If we get a hold of grace we will be like they were. I'm thankful that grace is for the young and it helps them to outlive bad choices and decisions. I'm thankful that grace is for those of us in the prime of life who at times abuse our position and influence. I'm thankful that grace is for the elderly who look back over a lifetime involving regrets and missed opportunity. Now, as we have looked at grace, we have looked at five different facets of it. I want you to think of grace as like a a jewel, a a diamond, something of, of, of rare and precious value that has these different facets, pure and without flaw. As you look at it from every angle, under any kind of light and circumstances, grace is that perfect jewel. Its facets all work together to make it the beautiful thing that it is. It's been said that grace is everything for nothing to those who don't deserve anything. Imagine God sent you to a foreign land to preach the gospel and you met a leper. And suppose God told you, Embrace him and kiss him on the cheek. You look at him and you see a deformed face that's eaten away with disease. And you think, Lord, you've got to be kidding. I could never do that. Most of us would find that difficult. But isn't that what God did for us? Alas, sinful nation... People weighed down with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, sons who act corruptly. They have abandoned the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away from Him. Where will you be stricken again? 
as you continue in your rebellion. The whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. Listen to this. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is nothing sound in it, only bruises and welts and raw wounds, not pressed out or bandaged, nor softened with oil. Isaiah 4, 1, 4 through 6. That passage is not talking about a physical sickness. It's talking about a spiritual illness. One that only God could cure. One that was incurred because of their behavior, because of their response to God. Sin is ugly. It's a sickness that leads to spiritual death and eternal separation. But I'm so thankful that Jesus once said, They that are well or whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Jesus offers Himself as the great physician. As the old timers used to say, He's never lost a case. To one who comes to Him seeking healing, God's always able through His Son to succeed in that. That's grace. And may we find it, embrace it, and respond to it in obedience.